Hey everyone, Dan here with another video, and today we're gonna go off the beaten path. I'm gonna be talking about a manga that has really just debuted in the past month and a half. And if you guys enjoy this video, hell, I might make it a part of the channel. The manga is called Kaiju Number no. 8, and honestly, only being a mere 7 chapters in, I have some pretty bold claims. So don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell, and if you enjoy this video, be sure to hit that like button. That way, I'll know to make more Kaiju No. 8 content. I don't know if this is obvious, but this video is gonna spoil the first little bits of Kaiju No. 8. Now let's open up and grab a drink. Ah, uh, so, brand new series. It's, uh, it's actually kind of weird to talk about something other than Vigilantes. Frankly, I read most of the titles right now in Jump, and honestly, I thought at first I'd probably branch off into something like Attack on Titan or Chainsaw Man, but when I saw Kaiju No. 8, I immediately clicked on it. For me, the main attraction to Kaiju No. 8 was the fact that growing up, I loved Godzilla. I mean, even if it was Zilla in 2000, I always showed love to the King of Monsters. But yeah, I saw the cover and I was immediately entranced. I'm the type of guy that art direction will turn me off immediately. And to be quite honest with everyone, I didn't really like the art direction of My Hero Academia at first. But it grew to become one of my favorites. The major pull of My Hero Academia was the fact that I loved the concept of the story so much. I was able to embrace the art as it supplemented the story greatly. Kaiju No. 8, on the other hand, it was fresh. It reminded me of the cartooniness that My Hero Academia provided, but then suddenly we're getting like, you know, Murata levels of detail. So the art style, like I said, to me, you know, it can turn me off, it could be a deal breaker, but the biggest deal breaker will always be the story. And Kaiju No. 8 does not upset in that department. The story of Kaiju No. 8 follows a 32-year-old Kaiju disposal man, Habino Kafka. We don't know much of Kafka's backstory, but we do know that kaiju attacks have definitely molded this entire, you know, world and his existence. We see him make like an Eren from Attack on Titan type of oath with a young lady named Mina Ashiro, which we later find out that he has feelings for, but their pact was to eliminate all kaiju. Well, fast forward all those years from when they're children and Kafka has a content job where he's working cutting kaiju apart as a kaiju garbage man, essentially. When a kid joins as a part-timer, this kid, Reno Ichikawa, wants to be a part of the defense force and his boss unnecessarily mentions that Kafka himself wanted to be, you know, a part of the defense force. Reno, being blunt and to the point, asks why Kafka gave up. Kafka says something along the lines of competition being stiff and, you know, acknowledging his own limits. Kafka kind of shrugs it off that, you know, it'll be something that Reno understands when he gets a little bit older. Reno replies that, nah, he ain't gonna understand because he's not a quitter. And I get it, Reno kind of comes off as an asshole right here, but he's actually pretty respectful when someone genuinely helps him understand something and becomes better from it. As the day progresses and Kafka teaches him about the anatomy of a kaiju, he starts to acknowledge Kafka as his superior. He recognizes now that he knows a ridiculous amount of information about a kaiju and their anatomy. And at one point, inspired by Kafka, he kind of tells him that the age for enlistment has increased and that Kafka's opportunity to become a soldier, it's still in sight. Immediately after, they're attacked by a kaiju, and Kafka does exactly what we've learned from My Hero Academia. What is the one thing that every hero has in common? They have the moment where their body moves without them even thinking. Kafka, rushing in, saves Reno. And as he's doing it, he's reminiscing about losing his family, his home, even, you know, not even saving the local cat. He screams for the boy to run, and he does! And as the kaiju moves in to kill Kafka, Reno returns and hits him in the face with a stop sign to get the attention of the kaiju after it strikes down Kafka. Kafka then has his big moment of change, where the metamorphosis before the actual metamorphosis occurs. The point where I would like to say that Kafka, you know, hits the lowest that he can possibly go. Feeling so powerless and just seeing the memories of failing the defense force test, and he screams, and as he screams, Mina Ashiro snipes the kaiju, blowing its face off. They're rescued by the defense force, and in the hospital, Kafka and Reno are inside recovering. Kafka is staring off into space when the silence is broken by Reno. He says, without him, right now, right here, he would be dead. And honestly, he thinks that Kafka still has a chance, and that he should try to join the defense force. A shy Reno tries to put back on his gruff persona, but it's too late. His words have cut way too deep. Kafka is changed by his words, and he resolves to shoot for the defense force one last time. But before that could happen, suddenly a weird tiny kaiju floats in front of Kafka. It enters his body and transforms him into a crazy demon-looking kaiju. Reno, after a hilarious confrontation, realizes that this kaiju is still Kafka, and they have to get out of there immediately. 
Which, mind you, this is an awesome character quirk here. Reno understands the crazy circumstances almost immediately, which to some would, you know, kind of come off as a weird coincidence, and maybe this whole, you know, person turning into a kaiju thing is known by more people than we think. But with that being said, with not much to go off of story-wise, my main pitch to read this manga would have to be that the main character just feels like such a refreshing archetype. Every hero in Shonen Jump starts from zero, and somehow they figure out how to be the best, or achieve like, you know, a huge goal, like, you know, getting One Piece or whatever that shit is. The thing is, Kafka is the definition of trying to end act one of your life by skating in by the skin of your teeth. He's a 30-something trying to reclaim the dream that he had as a child by morphing it into his goal. Granted, Reno was a big source of inspiration. The kid came off as a character that was a total dick, but in the end, he becomes a huge fanboy of Kafka. And to be quite honest, I can see why Kafka gave up. From the first couple of chapters, it didn't look like Kafka had a really decent support system. He's completely alone. We could see that Mina totally knew the guy below her was Kafka when she saved him, but she's too much of an immature character and we can see that because she doesn't even associate herself with somebody that she might consider a quitter. And I guess for some reason she might just like take offense to him becoming discouraged, which makes me think that they had like a huge argument when Kafka finally decided to quit going into the defense force. Kafka innately just thought that he didn't have what it took and he just took on the role of the loser. And with that realization, he kind of fell into being complicit, you know, just working in kaiju disposal. But that's not the case anymore. Habino Kafka's name is actually derivative of Franz Kafka the author of a book called The Metamorphosis, which is a story about a guy who goes to sleep and wakes up as an insect. Essentially, it's a story that just kind of doesn't have a pleasant ending, and I'm not trying to give you guys, you know, an English lesson, but the author states that the theme of his story is that of responsibility, isolation, alienation, and sacrifice. All of which I can say in the first seven chapters, Kafka embodies. We've seen him own the responsibilities at his job, even if he hates them, and we've seen him neglect the responsibilities in his personal life. Isolation. Kafka goes to work, comes home, and drinks himself to sleep. In turn, he's alienated anybody from becoming involved in his life by constantly becoming a focal point for random people's ridicule. Last but not least, sacrifice. Kafka embodies the traits of a hero, somebody who wants to protect. He doesn't care if it might turn him into the most wanted person in Japan. If he could save somebody's life, he'll be damned if he doesn't try, even at the cost of his own body. All in all though, it kind of does feel like we have two protagonists in Kaiju No. 8 and Kafka and Reno. Reno definitely has the mysterious side, and there's no denying that he's way too calm seeing Kafka all kaijued out. And being ride or die so quickly, I mean, that's some Genos level of commitment. And frankly, when we see the prospects that they're up against, Reno is fairly below average compared to them. So it might be interesting to see if Reno has trouble getting into the defense force, and how he'll be able to deal with projection and success if both kind of come into play. It's two sides of the coin finally teaming up with one another, and I'm anxious to see how this duo succeeds in this crazy kaiju world. But yeah, like some of my friends have said, the generation of people that are really into manga now are in their 20s, and seeing older representation kind of makes me feel a little bit more comfortable getting older. I guess when I'm 50, Inu Yoshiki will probably hit different. I know Avatar will. I know, another Avatar reference. I'm going to be spitting straight arrow lines at the end, don't worry. All in all, I think Kaiju No. 8 is a manga everyone should give a try. I read it on Viz every Thursday, and I think once it gets a bit more chapters under its belt, it's ripe for an anime. The content, the story, it all lines up. It takes itself more seriously than some of the other titles in Jump right now. Like, Mashal is a great starter manga, I love it, but it kind of makes itself tedious when you have a main character that kind of feels like Saitama from One Punch Man. So, let me know in the comments down below if you gave Kaiju No. 8 a try. And before I go, I've been imparting the words of the great Iroh from Avatar The Last Airbender to people, so I figure, why not you guys too? So I figure that, you know, Corona has a lot of people down right now, and a lot of people kind of have pause buttons put on their life, and a lot of people are just kind of wandering down a path where they just, they don't know where they're going. So, here's a quote from Uncle Iroh. Sometimes life is like a dark tunnel. You can't always see the light at the end of the tunnel, but if you just keep moving, you'll come to a better place. I'm getting out of here. I'll catch you guys later. Cheers.